morning. Um, so when Ortwin asked me to give this uh, visionary talk, he said, well, you want to talk about things beyond what you, know, you do yourself and think about what could be possible for, for the future. I was like, oh, no, <laughs> that's a pretty big task. So what I did, um, and I'll acknowledge this is, uh, along the way, is I enlisted some help uh, of some experts. Because I feel that gives you uh, my perspective from uh, materials, chemistry, physical chemistry world, as well as what's possible from the pioneering leaders in, in other areas in, in nano optics. So I titled this Peering Through the, the Looking Glass for a couple of different reasons. I think it makes a lot of sense to talk about mirrors. I think it also talks a lot of sense to talk about perfect transmission. There's all sorts of interesting th things that you can do with nanoscale uh, objects and how they interact um, with, uh, with light. And the other thing I wanted to state about the frontier is like it's initially, say, 10, 15 years ago, when we were first learning to control structure so that we can find all of these really interesting uh, properties, is that we, we started it and it's like, oh, wow, it's interesting. And then, and then we got specialized. We said, oh, well, this is more interesting than, than this area. And so what I want to dissuade us of that and talk a little bit more about how there's a lot of opportunities just depending on, on the structuring of the material. So that's what I'll be talking about today. Okay, so this is the, the current group. When I talk about uh, the work that's related uh, to my own group, these are the two students that primarily uh, contributed, and, and George Schatz uh, has helped tremendously with the, the theory and the modeling, and Rich Schaller with some of the ultra-fast measurements. So I just wanted to uh, acknowledge that um, uh, up front because it's the students that really contribute to the driving of the work. Okay, so I want to introduce uh, materials uh, as a platform for new types of, of phenomena. And I've just highlighted three here, metals, dielectrics, and, and semiconductors. And so you can sort of see, this is what I try to do with PowerPoint, you know, there's, there's something behind the, the, the mirror. What is, what is behind the mirror? Um, so as I mentioned earlier, sometimes you wanted to make perfect reflectors, and we can do this with certain types of, of uh, materials over different types of wavelengths. And other times you would like to have perfect transmission, or other times you would have, like to have um, anomalous reflection or transmission. And so this is what's possible using these nanophotonic uh, elements. And I want to introduce uh, different types of ideas of what happens when you put these nanoresonators very close to each other, and what happens if you space them out just a little bit more. I want to talk about uh, structure being a key uh, parameter, um, what I believe is going to be very important moving forward in the area of nano-optics and nanophotonics. And also the advantage of putting multiple length scales side by side and what is necessary in order to be able to do that to manipulate light going, in, for example, in a certain uh, direction. So you can combine all of these three properties, all these three materials with these types of structuring for some really new applications, and I'll talk about uh, one example in just a minute. And then I'm gonna finish up the, the talk with some of our own work when we're trying to couple together the, the very uh, advantageous properties of, of metals uh, uh, interacting um, and spaced with uh, photonic uh, wavelengths. So I was quite interested in this um, idea of what can happen and these next advantages in, in nanophotonics and what is necessary. Harry Atwater published this perspective in Nature Materials just recently, but the idea is that um, in the next 20 or 50 years, the ability to use radiation uh, pressure from a laser, ground-based laser, for example, to propel uh, a nanocraft or a light sail to um, uh, uh, an exoplanet surrounding Proxima Centauri. So that would be quite interesting. There would be huge uh, um, ad advances in, in nanophotonics and materials needed. And so uh, the, this perspective talks about well, what, how, what types of organization and materials are needed in terms of photonic, um, uh, nanophotonic uh, crystals or pillars or stacks. What are the materials characteristics in terms of reflection uh, and absorption? And here are some other uh, ideas on how you might think about this problem. So I think this is really interesting. This is sort of far off in the future, decades, decades off, but really the key uh, um, way that's going to get us there is the idea uh, of nanophotonics. So there definitely needs to be a widening of what is possible for these types of um, ideas. So going backward in time, though, in terms of how do we think about this idea of very tiny objects that can produce this very large macroscale response, I mean, this goes back to, to Huygen, and I'll just 
you know, these are these tiny little scatterers. And the, you can just describe this as any point on a wavefront can be considered as point sources. That's what all of these little yellow dots indicate. They scatter these uh, spherical waves. Um, at a later point, the new position of the wavefront will be the surface tangency to use these secondary wavelets. So this idea that you can have a very thin interface and very tiny scatterers producing this macroscale response is you know, 300 years old. Um, but it wasn't until recently that we as a community have been able to take advantage of these types of uh, individual scattering effects to produce uh, anomalous types of uh, properties. So this idea on uh, something called a, a metasurface uh, consists of nanoscale unit cells. This idea was first um, um, proposed in, or at least published in 2011 by Federico uh, Capasso's group. And so the idea here is that these types of nanoscale antennas, in this case they're made out of metal, they're designed based on analytical wave optics uh, equations, and so each of these are gonna shift the phase of light by a certain amount. And if you organize them in a certain way, you can get things, for example, as an anomalous uh, reflection. Um, and you can also get these uh, optical vortices. So this is a very um, interesting way to start thinking about how these flat substrates can produce these interesting types of properties. Okay, so some benefits of this uh, flat optics, which was recently uh, published here, is that from a fabrication perspective, we heard about some fabrication in the, in the previous talk, is that it can be in principle cost effective. You can do this with a single type of mask. If they're all the same height, you're just controlling uh, the shape in, in plane. Uh, a second advantage is that these potentially could be compact, which means they could also be uh, vertically integrated. And a final benefit, is that they can be uh, multifunctional, and we'll talk a little bit about this uh, going forward. So these uh, specific advantages, uh, 2011, have seen um, much progress since um, the last time. Okay, this is a little, let me just get over here. Okay, so I, uh, I asked Federico, I said, okay, what are these interesting ideas that you can tell me about for at least dielectric uh, metasurfaces? So the first examples were done in metals and then they've moved a little bit to dielectrics over the past couple of years. And one of the first examples was this high efficiency uh, metal lens uh, in the visible, which was really nice. You can see that these all have the same vertical height. They just are, are they have different uh, lateral sizes to be able to change the phase. There was a demonstration of an achromatic uh, metal lens across the, the visible, meaning you can uh, focus any wavelength of light to the same location, which is pretty nice. It overcomes these challenges of chromatic aberration. There was a recent example of an electrically tunable uh, metal lens, so by applying a bias, you can get uh, differences of 100% and the focal length, and also the scaling up of these uh, metal lenses in terms of, of manufacturing. So some of what uh, 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 Federico Capasso was thinking about in terms of uh, planar optics is he'd like to make CMOS compatible flat optics for a range of different applications. Okay, these are still at the component level. So cameras, displays, wearable uh, optics. There are different types of materials depending on which uh, wavelength range that you're interested in manipulating. And of course, these flat optics components can be integrated in lenses, holograms, polarizers, fav phase plates for machine uh, vision, any of these OEM markets that we had heard about uh, in the previous talk. And what, what's advantageous about the multifunctionality is that you can replace a, a bunch of different compound um, systems that have to be put together into a single, into a single planar uh, 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 object, which reduces the footprint and system complexity. And so um, there was this uh, company by him that is, and he, he and his coworkers that uh, has just uh, launched. But there have been some other um, metasurface uh, milestones, and so I um, asked Yuri Kivshar for his ideas along along these lines, and he was excited about some of the work that he's done with Hatice Altug in terms of uh, using image-based molecular barcoding. So you can um, image different types of, um, or visualize different types of amide bonds, for example, in proteins, just by looking at what might be scattered onto a, a CCD. But the building units of these are these um, silicon-based um, structures, and you can control their, their different ratios and, how they, um, and their spacing to give you different types of, uh, for example, reflection. So these different patterns will give you an indication on this amplification of a certain uh, wavelength. So these other ideas, I'm talking to uh, Nikolay uh, Gelatev on the ability to really uh, take advantage of broken symmetry. So this goes all the way back to structure that I mentioned to you earlier. So if you can control the, the unit cell, something like this, or these split ring resonators, 
that you can start to get these really interesting uh, optical, optical resonances with very high quality effectors and very, very narrow. And so these ideas are related to something that I'll summarize in just a minute based on bound states in the continuum. But you can see that the structuring is, is really the key driver to, to make these different types of uh, materials properties. Uh, and finally, by uh, Andrei Sukarev, there's this really nice paper, I think, that just came out uh, last week, where the idea is you can pass uh, photons through an uh, all dielectric metasurface, and you can read out or decompose and disentangle the, the quantum uh, states uh, of those photons. And so this is really quite interesting. I know there's a session on quantum photonics, but the ability really to, to manipulate structure has opened up a, a wide range. You can see their frontiers being widened on the possibilities of, of discovery. Okay, another uh, example uh, that I think is quite interesting just based on uh, structuring is this idea of uh, bound states in, in a continuum. So this was published uh, last year by uh, Bobakar Kantu. And just for those, uh, just to re-summarize what a bound state might be, it's a, it originated in uh, quantum mechanics as maybe as an anomaly, but um, it's a resonance that doesn't decay. And you can actually describe it by, uh, by wave uh, physics. And this cavity mode has a very high uh, quality factor. In principle, it can be uh, infinite, even though it's within a continuum uh, uh, density of states. There are lots of places where this photon um, can, can go. And so this paper uh, describes the, the way that you can uh, pattern little resonators of, uh, of a semiconducting material such that they're, they're basically isolated in air. And you can take advantage of, of this bound state to get really um, uh, robust uh, lasing. And so this is what the, um, the input-output light curve looks like as you pump uh, at harder and higher pump powers. And what they found is that this lasing wavelength uh, scales with the radii uh, of the resonator according to these uh, BIC modes. So this is really nice. You can sort of see that here. And moreover, as we're talking about fabrication tolerances, I mean, these will be uh, more robust to, to fabrication tolerances, which are intrinsic into any manufacturing process. So I think that's something we have to think about if we're really going to take advantage of these um, new discoveries, is what are the tolerances that are going to be allowed for, um, for uh, integration in real systems. And so this is a nice example of what this uh, looks like. So these uh, um, semiconductors are made of these indium gallium arsenide phosphide uh, quantum wells. Um, and finally, uh, related to, uh, uh, thanks to Bubakar for these, um, um, these sort of uh, cartoons or these schemes of what's interesting in terms of making uh, different regions of patterned uh, materials, this is the way that I, I think about it, he's thinking about designing uh, cavities where you're talking about arbitrarily closed contours and having the light move in a specific uh, direction where you're breaking time reversal symmetry. And see, so he reported this, um, this, uh, this photonic crystal based on these mul um, multiple quantum wells um, that's on top of this uh, yttrium um, iron garnet uh, substrate. So when you can apply a magnetic field, then you can switch the direction that the light might go. And so in this case, um, if you're thinking about multiple length scales, as I introduced earlier, you have these bigger uh, photonic crystal in the middle with this bigger type of mesh-like structure. And then it's surrounded by a, a triangular photonic crystal that operates and has a very different uh, type of band structure. So what this means is that you get these distinct topological invariants. And if you look at the lasing sig signature, meaning if you pump this system and uh, below threshold, there, there's nothing in the camera. Uh, but if you pump the system above threshold, then you can see that um, you get uh, lasing at the edges. So this is one of these first examples of these topological uh, lasers. And moreover, it's, uh, it's uh, shape independent. So as long as you engineer the, the relative structures between the interior and the surrounding areas, you can have this uh, very interesting uh, lasing-like cavity that just goes uh, one way around this arbitrary uh, surface. So this is a new way for us to start to be thinking about, well, how does structure relate to these types of, of properties? OK, so what I want to do in the rest of the time is, is sort of build on what was uh, uh, been achieved over the past couple of years and sort of intersect it to some of the work that, that, that we have done. And building on that, this is uh, uh, part of a laser uh, conference as well as uh, um, 
some of these ideas in, in imaging and lensing, I thought I would, I would talk about some of the progress that my group has made in uh, two different potential applications. One is in uh, the component of, uh, of a laser, and then one of them is the, the use of uh, lenses. Okay, so what we're interested in is um, not just uh, miniaturization. So I've talked a little bit about the dielectric cases where there's a huge uh, advance if you can make them smaller and manipulate light in these new types of ways with inspiration from uh, quantum physics. But I think if we're talking about metals, if you compete head to head in the same architecture, metals are going to lose <laughs> because metals are, are, are lossy in a way that, the, uh, that dielectrics and semiconductors aren't. However, uh, metals actually have very specific advantages that I think we can uh, integrate in these types of platforms such that they do things that the dielectric structures uh, can do. So we're interested in taking advantage of, of plasmons, which is a collective excitation of electrons, and they respond in resonance to an applied, um, to applied uh, electric field. And so because these fields are tightly confined to the particle uh, surface or to the structure surface, I think this type of architecture offers new designs for uh, flexible optics. So some of the dielectric systems that we talked about are of, of pretty impressive performance, but the tolerances are not such that you can easily integrate them into, into, uh, into flexible substrates. I think there are new different types of mechanisms in order to manipulate light. And uh, finally, I think there's some interesting ways that we can think about reversibly tuning or tuning the response in a way that um, doesn't have high uh, degree requirements, meaning you can do this at room temperature or small changes in, in strain. I think this uh, will allow us to think about new ways on uh, metal-based optics and their potential applications. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to employ the, uh, the intrinsic properties of plasmons. Or another way of saying this is we want to take a perceived disadvantage and turn it to, uh, turn it to a, an advantage. Okay, so the system that I want to focus on is seemingly simple. It's just these nanoparticle arrays. And so if I look at a, a single uh, nanoparticle there that has a dipolar um, emission, uh, radiation pattern, you'll see that, uh, you'll agree with me, okay, these particles are not so impressive, right? You look at their scattering cross-section, it's very, very broad. The quality factor of this is, is very, very low. So what are these uh, can potentially be uh, useful for? So it turns out, if you take the same nanoparticle, the same dimensions, and you put it into an array, and you space the particles out, mostly by a, a diffraction-based spacing uh, on, the or, or on the order that the photonics is really uh, good at, you get these very strong dipolar interactions. And so you'll take something that looks like this, which is very, very broad, and then you can narrow it up substantially. You also get some uh, added benefits. You get enhanced local fields. So these fields on a per particle basis are much higher in an array than as an isolated particle. You have reduced uh, radiative loss uh, because everything is now scattered and the light is trapped uh, in plane. And these particles are not that big, say they're on the order of 15 nanometers tall. And then you slow the depletion of the plasmon energy. So plasmons can decay on the order of tens of femtoseconds, which often makes them too fast to do anything useful. Um, but by, by manipulating the, the uh, plasmon lifetime, then you can take advantage of all of these uh, other uh, interesting effects. Okay, and so this is what it looks like theoretically. So George Schatz had predicted this uh, about 15 years ago, where you have these larger type particles and you space them out uh, in a diffracted like uh, separation. And then in principle, you can get these line widths that are less than or on the order of one nanometer at room temperature. And so this is where you really start to take advantage of, of collective effects. You don't have to do anything special except put them in an array to get um, narrow uh, line widths. So what we're interested in is using, uh, taking advantage of the plasmonics, meaning there's very high local fields around the particles, as well as taking advantage of, of the photonics where you can start to get these really high quality resonances. So these are sort of uh, hybrid modes. Okay, so my group is interested in developing new types of uh, manufacturing or scaling up patterning ways to, uh, to produce these over, at least in the academic setting, uh, large areas. So these are, uh, this is a scanning electron micrograph of what these particles look like. These are the dimensions. And you can see that they're patterned over about a square inch. And so um, if, you are interest, if we look at the optical properties of these arrays, this is just the normal incidence transmission. You can see if we surround them with a 1.52 index, we have a, a resonance which is around uh, 900 nanometers. 
If we re reduce the refractive index environment that's around the particles, then you can systematically blue shift the, the resonance. So this is really nice. You have the same particle arrays, you just change the dielectric environment and you can shift these uh, resonances. Um, if you look at their dispersion properties, or this is very similar to what be, be a, a, a photonic uh, band structure, you'll see that um, it matches uh, very well with, uh, with, exper with uh, calculations. And if we look at what we uh, call the, the band edge state, there's two uh, fundamental length scales that are really important for these types of effects. So these particles are all interacting with each other. They're all coherent. Actually, they're all in phase. And so what you see in the, in the fields is that they're tightly confined uh, around the particle. And moreover, this is the plasmonic effect. And then you'll notice that there's a larger length scale corresponding to the photonics effect, and this is a standing wave pattern. So at this particular site, at, at k parallel equals zero, you're gonna have a very high local uh, optical density of states, where the, the, the group velocity uh, is about uh, zero based on slope. Okay, so how can this type of structure be used um, in, in any type of, of, of lasers? So the idea that uh, uh, plasmonic cavities could be used as um, any type of uh, surface plasmon amplification or light-based amplification was uh, proposed about 10 years ago. And so the idea is you would have this uh, plasmonic uh, nano cavity, you surround it by gain, and then out pops this huge benefit. You have an ultra-fast, uh, coherent uh, light source. And it's really a way to think about overcoming uh, the diffraction limit. Because plasmons, as I mentioned, they squeeze their fields into deep sub-wavelength volumes. And so if you get any type of amplification, it's happening in this deep sub-wavelength volume. So of course, the cavity structures and their designs are quite different. So these were the first uh, quintessential uh, architectures for this type of idea, whether you're amplifying uh, surface plasmons and then getting them out uh, as light. Uh, with this core shell particle, this one-dimensional uh, metal dielectric waveguide, or this metal insulator metal waveguide structure. The problem, or the, the challenge is that for all of these different cases, especially for, for these two, you need lower uh, temperatures, which makes things challenging. Or, and it's very difficult to control the directionality of the light. Okay, in plane, you might be able to do something, but if you wanna do something um, in the far field, that's really difficult. So in 2008, there was this proposal that said, okay, why don't we take these little resonators, put it on a slab, and each of these little resonators now can, um, can overlap with the gain to produce some type of lasing response. Um, and this was pretty nice, so it comes out on, on both sides. And the, the array structure gives you the, the directionality um, that you might expect. However, um, this was at um, terahertz uh, frequencies, and what we'd like to do is, is move this to the, the visible uh, which my group did with a, a much simpler uh, system. So it actually took some time uh, from this uh, prediction, which sounds relatively straightforward, to get to, to a place where we can actually start to, to do this. So in this case, these, um, these are not split ring resonators, but these are just these little cylindrical particles, which I introduced earlier. You're um, exciting the, the gain, it's transferring its energy to the, the metal particle, and then you're getting uh, light emission out. Okay, so how does this work? I need to go through some key components of why I think this architecture is so special so that we can appreciate why we might be able to tune this response on the fly. Okay, so this is the system and this is the pump that I showed you earlier. You're pumping, in this case, it's a uh, laser dye, IR140. The dye is transferring its energy to, to the particles. So this is the lattice mode. This is the single cavity mode that I told you about uh, earlier. This is the photoluminescence uh, of the gain. And if you uh, pump the, the dye and it transfers its energy to the plasma, you'll get uh, lasing exactly at the, the cavity wavelength. What that means is if you tune this cavity mode anywhere within the photonic, uh, uh, sorry, the gain bandwidth of the dye, you can, you can tune the emission in this very simple system. Okay, so there are a couple of key uh, characteristics that I need to point out. Um, for those of you who work in the, in the laser business, especially related to new types of designs, uh, you might be aware that uh, Nature Photonics and all these Nature X journals now have this laser checklist. And, um, and that's within the past couple of years. <laughs> and the reason for that is everyone was trying to, to uh, think that they had lasing, but they're actually really str stringent uh, criteria to, in order to be able to validate this effect. And so I wanna sort of just point out this um, as we go. So in this case, particular system, it's a single mode uh, lasing. All the highest local optical density of states is at that bandage mode, so that's really nice what we have. Whoops, ooh. 
OK, you're going to, that's, yeah, so did you see that? It was like, OK, that's, that's never happened before. OK, let me go back. OK, here we go. Um, yeah, that was really, you know, you could just shorten the talk like by, you know, 90%. OK, so uh, it's uh, narrow align width. Uh, we have a clear threshold, uh, and we have a low beam divergence. But also, we want to talk about mechanism. So how does this work um, as we think it, it does? And mostly what we're interested in is mechanism. We're in an academic uh, setting. We're not building the fanciest high-powered lasers. But as we learn more about how these systems work at the nanometer scale, I think that will allow us to think about different things uh, moving forward. And so we spent a long time actually trying to figure out the, the mechanism, and modeling helps in this way. So we're modeling the dye uh, quantum mechanically, and it's a four-level system. And then we're modeling the dye using um, electrodynamics. And so what we find out is you put, if you put 25 nanometers of dye around the particles, 50 nanometers, 100 nanometers of gain, or a slab of gain, you'll notice that the, the threshold um, is the same. Okay? So what does that mean? That means that you only need 25 nanometers of gain around the, the particles. This already reduces the effective footprint, especially significantly in the vertical direction. And this is what it looks like. So below threshold, this is uh, the stimulated emission map, or this is the map of what we would call population inversion. You can spatially see where you would, uh, get population inversion. So below threshold, there is really uh, not much there. And then above threshold, uh, this is what it looks like. So indeed, you'll see that you have emitters everywhere. We have gain everywhere. But it's only the dye molecules that are in the near field or right close to the particle that are actually contributing to this population inversion. And what's interesting here is that um, if you do a back of the envelope calculation in terms of, OK, well, how many dye molecules or how many emitters are actually contributing to the lasing signal, it, we only get like one molecule in this hotspot, one molecule per hotspot, which is really unusual, right? You might expect that you might need more in order to, to get this effect. So we're working on, on the numbers there. OK. In terms of structure, as I mentioned earlier, those are just, uh, those are just uh, cylindrical uh, pillars. But you can also change the structure. We uh, we're breaking the symmetry uh, a little bit, where you have both uh, an ellipse and you have uh, a rectangular array. And you can do this uh, very similar uh, experiment, but the setup is just a little bit different in order for us to, to measure this. And you get this polarization-dependent uh, lasing emission. So this type of structure is going to have do two different types of um, uh, lattice resonances. So for example, if we excite uh, uh, the in-plane phi equals zero, you have a lattice resonance here, and you get lasing uh, here, which is really nice. If you change um, the, the polarization, um, then you start to access this type of uh, lattice mode. And then it barely overlaps with the gain of the photoluminescence of the, of, of the dye, and you get lasing here. And then if you're at 45 degrees, where you can access both different types of, of lattice modes, you get lasing signatures exactly where the, the lattice mode is. So this is really nice. We haven't done anything here except change structure. This is a static substrate. And just by polarization effects, then you can get out one mode at one wavelength, one mode at a much longer wavelength, or two at the same time. OK, in terms of structure, we can also do something uh, which I think is really neat, which my group likes to think about as these hierarchical length scales uh, of interactions. And so this is the single lattice that I showed you uh, earlier, where you have a single particle, and they're all organized with the same spacing. But what you can also do is you can make what we call uh, super lattices. So you have um, this uh, length scale stays the same. So the separation and the particle sizes of the smallest length scales are the same. But we can organize them into what we call uh, patches. And so now you have arrays of arrays. And so I think the best language that we can think about these are, are, are super lattices. And so if you look at the, uh, I'm having trouble with this. OK, if you look at the uh, linear optical properties uh, of the super lattice, you can say, OK, this looks like some sort of resonance. This looks like some sort of resonance. But if you actually look at the, the lasing signatures, you see uh, something that's not accounted for uh, in the middle. So this is quite interesting. What have we done when we've um, built up this multi, um, multimodal sy system? OK, something is. I don't think I'm doing anything different. And 
And so we went back and looked at the linear uh, optical properties. And if you look at the band structure, it looks like this, which is quite uh, interesting. So you have all of these band crossings, not just at the, the zero band, not just at the band edge at k equals zero, but now all of these uh, bands that are, um, that are off normal. So this is really nice. Just by engineering this with multiple length scales, you get these flat bands that appear sort of uh, everywhere. Well, not everywhere, but well-defined according to the structure of the um, super lattice. And so as a, as a reminder that you only have a single band edge mode for, for this particular case. And then if you look at the, um, the lasing signatures, of course you just get a single uh, emission peak from the, from the the, the single lattice array, but you have uh, all of these different uh, emissions at these different positions in, in the super lattice. So this is quite special because in the linear optical properties, you can't see uh, evidence of these uh, flat banded areas. But in this, but in this, um, but using the lasing signature, now lasing can act like as a measure of uh, what you observe uh, in this case. Okay, and this is uh, just an example. Just wanted to put this up as a, as a demonstration of what is possible just by changing the particular um, um, sizes of the patches and the separations. You can independently control uh, where these uh, modes are. These modes don't compete with each other, which is quite interesting and very different from uh, uh, most um, semiconducting uh, lasers. And moreover, we can um, pattern in these into uh, patches of one of one dimensional patches. So for example, you have a one dimensional lines. So if you're uh, if you pump with a polarization that's perpendicular to the line, you get a single uh, mode. But then if you pump with a perpendicular uh, polarization that's par parallel, you switch to these multiple modes. So on a single substrate now, you can either get a single mode emission or you can get multi mode emission. And this is just by engineering what's happening in the particle substrate. Okay, so let me get to this uh, uh, programmable and this reconfigurable aspects. So because we have large areas, we can integrate them into a microfluidic channel. So the idea is, that this is the, what, the, uh, what the device looks like, is as long as I change the refractive index around the, um, around the particles, I can tune uh, the emission wavelength. And so you can see that this is, uh, in the static case, I have a bubble of a uh, more uh, same dye, but just a more red, a higher refractive index solvent, air bubble, and it goes back and forth like this. And so this is what the, the movie looks like in, in, in real time. So you have it at one uh, short wavelength, then you put an air bubble in, then it goes to a, a longer wavelength. Um, this is just at the very uh, end. And then you can put another air bubble in, and, and then it goes back. And so this is just in this uh, the same device. Okay, so, um, but the other thing that we can do is we can change the, the, the size of the particles, going back to structure and side-by-side -side, uh, um, um, organization, and then you get new excitation. So everything that I've showed you earlier is called, relied on these sort of dipolar uh, excitation, where you have this in-plane uh, dipole. But it turns out if you make particles larger, they support these uh, multipolar excitations, um, and in this case, it's a, a quadrupole mode. And so you have this quadrupole mode supported by the, the particle, where you have uh, plus, minus, plus, minus, and now this is an out-of-plane mode. So this out of plane mode is going to be, can be very special for tunability, because if we were able to put these particles in polydimethylsiloxane, which is an elastomer, which you see here, we can you know, fold it and manipulate it like this, so it's flexible. But really what we like to do is we like to be able to change the, the separation or, or the spacing. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to be tuning uh, the diffraction mode. And so this is what we did here. We patterned these particles, um, and these are larger now. We're taking advantage of these uh, hybrid uh, quadrupole lattice plasmons. And so you can see that they're, um, they're on PDMS, which is stretchable. And so we're surrounding it by a, a solvent with, with dye in it. And then we want, to, we want to stretch it. So the nice thing about this is by having the dye, uh, the gain, be in liquid form, even though you're stretching the substrate, you're always going to have dye molecules around the, the particles. So you're always going to have some emitter that's there that can then be used in the lasing process. And so this is what this uh, looks like. And so you, uh, indeed, you can see uh, you get uh, uh, lasing um, as a function of pump power. You can look at this. Um, this is, again, the population inversion curve. And where you get uh, emission is at these uh, positions now in four corners of the particles, because you take advantage of this quadrupolar uh, lattice mode. 
Uh, you are able to get reversibly uh, tunable lasing. So you start off, uh, you have an applied strain of 0 0.02. Um, you stretch it, and um, you can get a systematic uh, red shifting of the, of the lasing mode. These are quite narrow. And then you can release the, the stretch, and you get uh, very, uh, this, you maintain the, the narrowness of the mode. Okay, I'm going to skip the, the movies, but this, it matches the simulation uh, quite well. So there are a couple of important points. You get reversible um, nanolasing here. And you get it without uh, hysteresis, which is really uh, impressive. The other thing that's interesting is I was telling you, you don't, most of the time in plasmonics, you don't want to go head-to-head -to -head against photonics, except in fundamentals of these uh, light localization. But it turns out in this type of system, we have a much higher figure of merit. So you can strain uh, by a 0.03, and you get a, a wavelength shift of, of, say, 31 nanometers. And uh, the closest photonic counterpart, you have to strain it a lot for a reduced spacing. And I think the reason that this is so special is because you're really uh, relying on these uh, local near-field uh, effects. OK, so I have five minutes uh, to talk about uh, reconfigurable lenses. I'm not sure how that will go. We'll just go fast, I guess. I'll go show you some pictures. So. Um, this idea of stretching uh, to, to change the focal point was, uh, has been demonstrated before. Uh, about a couple of years ago, we ended up being uh, scooped a little bit, which we were thrilled about. But, um, but it lacks some element-wise control. And you notice that the focal point is not in a, in a really nice <clears throat> position. It's all spread out, as you might expect. Another interesting way to be able to reconfigure lenses is to in phase change material. So you do have single unit uh, level tuning. Um, however, um, you have this non-serial writing, and it's limited to different types of, of materials for this type of uh, um, scheme. And so we've been thinking a lot about the digital design of nanoparticle array space for uh, lensing. So I won't talk about this in detail. But we're using these localized uh, building blocks uh, of particles. And then we're using a genetic algorithm to be able to organize them in ways that we uh, want to achieve properties that are not possible just using normal wave uh, optic analytics. And so what we're interested in, in doing is actually using these lenses for, for imaging. So we want to take advantage of this infinite array of particles that I told you about earlier. But we want to wave, shape the wavefront just by changing the local dielectric around the, pattern, around the particles. So instead of having to pattern the particles individually, we want the same array of particles, but just to stamp different uh, dielectric. And so we can do this um, in this case. And the reason I should mention it, of course, is if there's an index mismatch, the air is just going to, the, the, the light is just going to go right through. But if the index is the same, similar to what I told you about strongly coupled resonators, everything's scattered in plane. That's the way it works. That works so well. So this is a, a pattern substrate based on these lattice plasma lenses. You have PMMA, for example, here and air in some places. The near fields are quite strong. You can see just by patterning the dielectric around the particles, you can focus to different uh, distances. It looks quite good. You can uh, focus to two uh, points in, this, um, in the same plane, three points in, in uh, different planes. So this is really quite uh, unique for these different types of flat uh, lenses. You can go up to three or, or five uh, focal points. These are all experimental uh, images. And then uh, moreover, what we'd like to do is to be able to, to scale it. We talked about the ability to scale things. So this is like having some problems. And so we've uh, invented this type of technique that enables you to, uh, to, <laughs> to, to, to actually scale the production of these guys. Please stay. OK. Um, and, and what we're doing is we're creating a, a, a mask that can uh, mold the, um, the dielectric. So this is really nice. We've used the genetic algorithm to see what types of lenses do we want, and then we transfer the pattern here. here. <coughs> Yeah, you know it's not good when it's like blinking red at you up here. So <laughs> we're almost done. OK, so what we're interested in doing is to be able to reconfigure on the fly. That's what we'd like to do. So we've uh, made this uh, uh, four focal point lenses. This is what it looks like. We take one mask, same substrate, adding no new material, and then we can get three focal point lenses. Okay. We can take the same substrate, um, apply this mask again, and then you can go back to, to four focal point. So this is quite nice, right? You've got four, three, four, three just by uh, molding. You haven't added any more material. You have the same material. You're just making it reflow in very specific uh, regions. 
And you can see what this is, looks like in terms of the, the focal points. But then you say, what does the imaging look like? And so uh, we did for the simple case something that looks like a Fresnel zone plate. This is the object and this is the image. It looks quite good. Uh, we're interested in testing some of the, the, the resolutions. So we looked at uh, multi-scale uh, objects. And we're close to, to the diffraction uh, limit based upon this wavelength that we're using. But the other thing that I think is interesting is we can do on-demand tuning. So this is a single focal point. This is the the object, this is the image. Um, we use our, our mask and just stamp on again uh, two uh, focal points, and these are the focal points, and, and this is the image, and then you can do four focal points, and this is the image. So it's really nice. You're just taking the same substrate, and you have the same object, and you can start uh, ramping it up in this way. Okay, so we're interested in a lot of different things, but I think uh, I'll stop here. But the, the reality is, I think the frontier is pretty big. Whether you're in the um, whether you started in the dielectric space or you're moving to the metals, you're starting in the metals and you're moving to semiconductors and dielectrics, I really think it's gonna be a, a mixture of materials and the ability to structure them from the nanoscale to the microscale and, and beyond. So I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs>